Welcome to Gateway's weekend experience, both online and in person. My name is Heather, and I'm so glad that you have joined us today. Here at Gateway, we are a community of people helping each other take steps in the right direction. And so we want you to have a great experience today as we participate together in various ways. We also want you to find a place to truly belong here and call Gateway home. So maybe your next step is finding an area to serve or joining a connect group. And we also encourage you to partner with us to care for those in our community. If you're newer to Gateway, maybe this is your first time here. We are so glad that you have joined us. We encourage you to complete a connect card by going to our Gateway app or website or scan the QR code on screen. And if you're with us here in person, please stop by the welcome desk out in the atrium before you leave today. We just wanna say hi and personally greet you and we have a gift for you. Our team is going to now lead us in some songs, so we invite you to stand and sing with us. Good morning, church. We're so excited to worship together today. Let's put our hands together.
But I've got my 
we can stand firm on your faithfulness. You are the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and we can trust in that truth. You are our provider. I pray over each heart here today listening in to this experience that they would hold to that truth, that they would be open to trust this word, that you are faithful, you are our provider. Thank you, God, for who you are and what you do in our lives. Be with us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for giving to Gateway. This supports the everyday needs of our church and ministries, and it helps us fulfill our mission of reaching many with God's love in practical ways and the good news of Jesus. There are various ways to give, which you can see on screen, and we just encourage you to be part of what we believe we are called to do. Coming up on Sunday, June 26th, in both of our experiences, we will be having water baptisms. And this is a symbol of identifying with Jesus and our new life we have in him. This is a necessary step in our faith journey. And so if you've placed your faith in Jesus, but you haven't been baptized, I encourage you to prayerfully consider if that is your next step and you can fill out an online application this week. At Gateway, we want the next generation of our kids and students to experience all that God has for them. And so we have online and in-person experiences just for them. For our middle school students in the room, grades six to eight, you are now dismissed out into the atrium for your experience. And we are now welcoming our grade five students to join us as well. So those going into grade six in the fall, grade five students, you are able to join us too. We are starting a new series today called AKA, and this is looking at various names of God. And so just before Pastor Rick comes to speak today, we are going to enter into a time of discussion with those sitting around you. Our question will be up on the screen. When you think about God, what names do you give him and why? Discuss with those around you. We'll be back in just a moment.
Well, good morning. So glad to have you all with us today, online and in person. Thanks for giving us some of your time this weekend. As already been said, we're starting this new series, AKA. It's an acronym that we use, uh, standing for as, also known as, which uh, when we were talking about a, a name for this series, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know what AKA meant. So did everybody, does everybody know what AKA means? Or is that new? I didn't know what it meant. Yeah. Well, our theme for this year is look up. That whatever's happening in your life, whatever difficulties, whatever challenges, Jesus would compel us that when all seems to be lost, when all is not well, we look up. And it's in his face that transcends all other difficulties and challenges. And in this series... We want to take a step backward into the Old Testament and look at some of the encounters that people had for the very first time with God. That whenever even the idea of God was so new and so foreign to them, and when he first revealed himself in humanity, what did they call him? Why did they call him? Could it be that they named him because of what they were experiencing in interacting with him? And if that's the case, when you first met God, what would you have called him? When you think of your very first encounters with God in your life, what names would you have assigned him? Now, I realize that's quite a provocative question to ask, but names are important, aren't they? Names names have power. Names have influence. And we all have a variety of names in our lives, don't we? Like we have the name uh, that we inherit. That would be our surname. For me, it's boys. Uh, then there's the name that our parents give us. It's our, it's our given name. And so my given name is actually, it's Ricky. It's not Richard. Don't call me Richard. That's not my name. You can call me Ricky, but you can't call me Richard. There's the name that our friends would give us growing up. We had nicknames. We all had various nicknames. I'm sure you had nicknames as well. So there's surnames and given names and nicknames, and, and then there's the pet name. That's the name that our loved one would give us. So do we have any pookies in the room or lovey pies or you know what? Or just TMI, like just don't even bother. We also have pain names, don't we? Pain names are the names that our enemies give us. We probably had a few of those in high school. They're, they're names of mockery, like Fatso, or Scarecrow, or Pizza Face, or something like that. Of course, growing up, we're always trying to make a name for ourselves. We perhaps might call that our signature name. And I remember watching my father whenever he would sign a check or a bill or something, and I would watch his signature. And he would always talk about how important your signature name is, a reflective of, of who you are. And so I remember practicing my signature and trying to get it down pat. Now, the problem with that was I was a young, young kid, and instead of practicing my signature on a pad of paper uh, and a pen or a pencil, uh, I decided to practice my signature with indelible black marker on all of the white baseboards of our home. (laughs) True story. Whole house. Whole house. That pain name thing? Yeah. Yeah, my name was Pain. Just, you just call me Pain for about a week. From the very beginning, history records of how God has encountered with people, how he spoke with people, and in that beginning, nobody knew what to call him. So the very first names given or ascribed to God was the name of Yahweh, or to translate uh, Adonai, or Lord, how we get that. And so take a look at this video, and it'll help us to get started today. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the second key word here, Lord, written in all capital letters. This is the personal name of Israel's God. 
We first learn the meaning of this name in the story of Moses and the burning bush in the book of Exodus chapter 3. God appears to Moses and he commissions him to liberate the Israelites from slavery. And so Moses wonders, what if people ask the name of the God who has sent me? And so God responds, tell them Ehyeh has sent me to you. Now that Hebrew word Ehyeh means I will in other words, God's name means that he is the one who is and who will be. God's existence doesn't depend on anyone or anything else. This God simply is. But it will sound kind of strange for Moses to go say to the Israelites, I will be has sent me to you. Only God can say, I will be. So in the next sentence, God tells Moses the version he should say aloud, Yahweh, the God of our ancestors, he has sent me to you. Now, that word Yahweh is the ancient Hebrew form of the verb he will be. And this is the personal name of the God of Israel. It appears over 6,500 times in the Old Testament. Now, here's what's interesting. Over the centuries, Israelites wanted to honor the sacred nature of this divine name. So as they read the Hebrew Bible aloud and they came to this name, they stopped saying Yahweh and instead started saying the Hebrew word for Lord, which is Adonai. Now this practice has been continued throughout the centuries and so later when people started translating the Bible into English, they adopted the same practice. Instead of spelling out the divine name, they translated it as Lord spelled in all capital letters. Okay, you got that? Good, because there's more. Ancient Jewish scribes wanted to prevent anyone from even accidentally saying this name aloud when you read the Hebrew Bible. And so they came up with a visual device to remind you to make sure you say Adonai. They took the four consonant letters of the divine name. These letters correspond to our English letters Y-H-W-H. Then they inserted the three vowels from the word Adonai and combined these together to create an artificial hybrid word, which if you pronounced it, it would say Yahuwah, but no Israelite ever said Yahuwah. It's simply a visual reminder to say the word Adonai. Now, it gets more interesting. Much later, Christian scribes came along who didn't know that Yahuwah was an artificial word. And so they began to say it aloud and spell it in their writings. This is the word that eventually entered into English as Jehovah, it's a word many people still use today. But the main thing is the word Lord in all capital letters is an indication of the divine name. Don't confuse it with the word Lord in your English translations that's not in all capital letters. That is the actual Hebrew word Adon, which just means Lord or Master. This word can refer to people like kings or the master of a servant, even a shepherd over his sheep. And sometimes biblical authors will use this word to refer to God, like in the phrases the Lord of all the earth or the Lord of Lords. But behind all of these words, Jehovah, Lord, Adonai, stands the original divine name of the God of Israel. It refers to the one who was, who is, and who forever will be. So as time went on, they had to come up with ways to ascribe the character and the nature of God. And they started calling on his name based on what he was doing, what he has done. They would create names based on his reputation, that is what he had done for them in the past and those names had caught on or the character and the nature of his presence and what he, what he represented. Sometimes they named him according to his authority. They would use words like powerful Lord and so they put adjectives in front of that name talking about what he might be doing in the future. They, they, they used phrases and words that would describe their identification of, of who they are in him and even anticipation of what they were hoping to become in him. And so this is how we get so many different names for God. And, and there are so many names. We, we could be here till September actually going over all of them. But it's no wonder that the writer to the Proverbs said this. He said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and that's where they are safe. The name of the Lord, which is why I suppose we're wanting to share this series on the names of God to remind us that there's power in the name of our Lord God. So when you think about God, what names do you give him? And on what are you ascribing that name? Is it based on what he has said or done in your life? Is it about your experience with God or is it just based on somebody else's experience? And one of the reasons why we want to do this series is because we're pretty sure that there's a lot of people who have never heard 
any of these stories before. So for some of you, this is old stuff. For others of you, this is fresh and brand new. One of the first names that was ever given to God was by a man named Abraham. And he called God Jehovah Jireh, which loosely translate the Lord will provide or God provides. Meaning that whenever and wherever anything happens in life, when there is a need, God has the supply. That God has the answer to whatever uh, is a burden or a pain or a problem in our life. That God always has a plan to move forward and to accomplish that plan, which for many of us, we would say, well, sure. Like, I agree with that. I hear what you're saying. I mean, didn't we just come back from the last six weeks of looking at the promises of God and that they were yes and amen? And by the way, if you're here today or you're listening online and, and you're new to faith or this is all so fresh to you and you're still not sure about fully trusting in God or Jesus, it's okay to doubt. It's okay to question and, or to even disagree. I get it. More importantly, you need to know that God gets it. I understand that there's times when stuff happens in life. I know that there are people here and there is some stuff happening and it makes you question the promises of God. It makes you question the name of God, his character, his revelation in your life. Does God? Will God? Hey God, you said, but this. No, 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 God, good. You can't do this. You can't ask this. You, you can't touch this. You can, you can make your promises. But this, this is coming up short. If that's you today, you're in really, really good company. Because I think that's why God gave us so many, hear me now, unbelievable stories, particularly in the Old Testament that we're going to look at. I think he knew that down the road, there would be doubters and questioners just like you. And he said, okay, let me show you my name and I'll reveal it in the lives of my people. And therein begins the story of Abraham and his son Isaac. The one whom God had promised. He had said to Abraham, through your son Isaac, I'm going to make you a great nation. That nation will become Israel. And I will bless the nations of the world. All of the world will be blessed through your son. This promise. It's found in Genesis 22. Let me read it for you. Then God said one day, I want you to take your son, your only son, the one that you love more than life, the one with whom that I made the promise. Take Isaac. And I want you to go to the region of Moriah. And there, I want you to sacrifice him. I want you to kill him. I want you to put him on a wood altar of fire and burn him. Early the next morning, Abraham gets up Lotus his donkey, he takes with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about to go to. On the third day, Abraham looked up and he saw this place in the distance. Do you ever wonder what went through his mind for those three days? For three days, he takes his son, whom he loves, God, what are you asking of me? He sees the place in a distance. He says to the servants, stay here. Stay here with the donkey Will I and the boy go over there and we will worship and then we'll come back to you. Abraham takes the wood for the burnt offering, places it on the altar. He takes his son, binds his arms and legs, he lays them upon the altar of wood. Isaac had said to him, oh, Dad, I, I see the fire, I see the, the wood, where is the sacrifice? 
Isaac had no idea that it was going to be him. Abraham said, God himself is going to provide a lamb for that burnt offering, my son. Little did Isaac ever think that he was the lamb. So as they reach the place that God had told him, he builds this altar, he takes his son, he lays him on there. As his son is bound, of course, you would, who wouldn't bind their son? Wondering if he has the courage to do the unthinkable. He raises the knife. He's about to plunge it into his son. The angel of the Lord, verse 11, says, the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Don't touch the boy. Don't do anything to him. Because now I know that you fear God because you have not even withheld from me your only son. Now I know that you trust me. Abraham looks up and there to the side in a thicket of bush, a ram has his horns caught in the bush. He goes over to the ram, he takes it, slaughters it, offers it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And then Abram stands before this altar and he calls that place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. Quite a story. I'm sure if it's the first time you've ever heard it, it's quite an ask, isn't it? Quite an ask of God. I mean, nobody can hear this story and not wonder, what would you do? How would you have responded? No, I'm just speculating, but I, you just kind of wonder... Like, I don't imagine they talked much about it after that day. But I can only imagine Abraham and Isaac. Isaac now much older. Abraham's on his way out, about to pass. He's an old, old, old man now. And I wonder if they reflected back about that day. That incredible story. Can you, can you, can you just imagine? Hey, Dad. Do you remember? That was quite an experience. You never said, would you have? Like, were you really going to do it? And Abraham says something like, Isaac, you need to understand there's something more I need to explain to you. There is, there's, it's more important and more valuable than anything you can ever see, touch, or feel. And that is to place your faith in God. If you're going to carry through with the promise that God has in mind, then you must have faith in God that his plan for you and for our families and our families' families, that it's far greater than anything we could ever imagine, but that God will accomplish this. You need to get this. You need to understand fully for yourself because you're going to carry the promise forward that's to be for all sons and all daughters. Isaac, nothing compares to having a relationship of faith with God. If you don't place your faith fully in him, then you have nothing. We have nothing. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And without God, where would we be? So when I took you to Moriah, we didn't have a sacrifice. I, I know it freaked you out when I tied you up. But you have to understand, it was pretty tough on me as well. I mean, I had waited for so many years. I had trusted in God for so many years for the promise of a son, and it was so hard, so hard. We weren't even sure that God existed. There had been so little communication. There had been so few conversations when I think about it. I like, I didn't even know his name. And while I've slowly gotten to know him, I thought, well, you want me to do what? Sacrifice him? Isaac, it's, it's like everything was in slow motion. For three days, 50 miles we walked, and I argued with myself 
and with this unknown God. I thought of all that you meant to me and, and it, meant, it was just so much harder because you represented my identity. I was Father Abraham. I felt safe in that I've been waiting to be Father Abraham for so long because God promised that I would be just that. I loved you more than any father could love a son and deep down inside, I just knew that wherever we were going or whatever was to happen, God would be with us. God would provide. And I held on to that. And Isaac, he did. He always provides. And so we're reminded today that God always provides what we need when we need it. I don't know who needs to hear this today. Maybe one, two, or, or, or I don't know. But, but I want you to know that whatever your need is today, God is here to provide. Now, I didn't say he's going to do it when you want it. I can promise you this. And for some people, this is one of the things that holds you back in your walk or your trust or your faith in God. Because you don't like the timing of God, so it's hard to place your faith in God. I would suggest to you that you will never have strong faith if you have to control the timing. It will always feel late. It will always perhaps seem inopportune. But God's timing is never wrong. We're reminded today that God provides generously and effortlessly. That he meets all of our needs with a limitless, endless supply of his vast riches without ever depleting heaven's storeroom for your life. And God provides because he wants to. He wants to bless us. You actually can't have faith in God if you don't believe that. You have to believe that he wants to bless you. Not begrudgingly, not stingily, not just for survival. And I want to remind you today as well that where God guides, he provides. Wherever you are today, maybe you've been waiting for a long time or you've been praying for something for a long time and you're discouraged. Our faith is in Jehovah Jireh the Lord, our provider. In my early years when I first started pastoring and uh, we, were, <laughs> we were working in, in Amherstburg just outside of Windsor and uh, they say they were paying us. I'd like to think we were, we were volunteering actually. <laughs> we both had to work full-time jobs as well while we were we're doing this. And I, I remember for the first couple years just how absolutely discouraging it was. Cheryl and I both worked opposite shifts. And so we, for almost two years, in the first couple of years of our marriage, we, we left notes on the kitchen table. And I hardly ever saw her. And, and like it was just really, really tough. And I, I remember... I remember saying to myself, God, I can't preach what I haven't lived, but I don't want to live like this anymore. And I remember getting so discouraged when I got to the place where I pulled out my credentials. It's just a little piece of paper that says that you're a pastor. I remember pulling it out. And sitting on the couch at about midnight, still waiting to see if, I, if Cheryl was going to come home because we just couldn't keep doing this. And I remember going, that's it. I can't keep doing this. And I remember throwing it on the floor and saying, God, we, I, I can't go any further. I got up the next morning. I went to work at the clothing store where I was working and the phone rang and I remember picking it up and it was a man from Godrich. And he said, hi, I'm a pastor in Godrich. And I went, yeah, okay. He goes, your name is sitting on my table, my desk. 
I said, I don't, I didn't give you my resume. How, how did you get my name? And he goes, well, I was just asking somebody else for a couple of names and they gave me these names. And I've been sitting here this morning praying about your name. I don't get this. I haven't even spoken to you. I don't have your resume. I just have your name. But I think you're supposed to come and pastor with me. And within a week, we met. And by the end of the month, we moved. And that was the beginning of the career of how I got here. So I want to encourage you today. You've been waiting these closing thoughts of you're, you're waiting for a breakthrough. You're waiting for God to show up. You're, you're discouraged and you're not sure you can go any further. You don't see your way out of the situation and you wonder, is God ever going to provide? Maybe the need seems to be so bigger. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it, you've, you've lost hope. Uh, uh, you're struggling and, and there's, there, there's an emotional need or a mental health need or or, or maybe it's a physical need. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. And if you will run into that name, if you will run under the name of God, he is fully able to provide what you need to give you the strength and endurance for whatever it is that you're facing today. When you came in today, you were given a, a card. I invite you to pull that card out. For this next series, we're going to give you a card every week. Simply, we want you to write out a personal prayer. We've given you some beginning points. And if you feel that, go ahead and begin to write out your prayers as you just listen to this song. I pray the Holy Spirit will guide you and lead you. And that you will keep this prayer close to you all week long. Pray it every day. Believing God to provide for your need. In Jesus' name.
shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow for God, love's purest joy is restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past, all safe and blessed. We shall meet at last in you. trust in our hope in that he is always faithful and he always provides I trust you are just as encouraged as I was by that sermon and keep your prayer cards close to you this week pray it over yourself each day thank you so much again for joining us I hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll see you soon